Introduction to Jew. That this epistle was written by Jew, one of the twelve apostles of Christ, and not by Jude, the fifteenth bishop of Jerusalem, who lived in the time of Trojan, a little before Bar Kokhba, the false messiah, as Herochus thought, is evident from his being called, in the epistle itself, the brother of James, and which is confirmed by all copies, and its agreement with the second epistle of Peter shows it to have been written about the same time and upon the same occasion. As to Jude's not calling himself an apostle, but a servant of Jesus Christ, it may be observed that the later is much the same with the former, and the Apostle Paul sometimes uses them both, as in Romans 1.1, Titus 1.1, and sometimes neither, as in 1 Thessalonians 1.1, and sometimes only servant, as Jude does here, Philippians 1.1. Though in some copies of the title of this epistle he is called Jude the Apostle, and as to Jude's making mention of the Apostles as if he was later than they, and not of their number, Jude one seventeen. It may be returned for answer to it, that the Apostle Peter expresses himself much in the same manner, Second Peter 3.2, where some copies, instead of us, the Apostles, read your Apostles, see Gil on Second Peter 3.2. Moreover, Jude seems to cite a passage out of Peter, as Peter in the same chapter cites the Apostle Paul, which only shows agreement in their doctrine and writing, and at most it only follows from hence that Jude wrote after some of the Apostles, as Paul and Peter, who had foretold there would be mockers in the last time, and that Jude had lived to be a witness of the truth of what they had said, nor does he exclude himself from their number, and that this epistle is a genuine one, appears from the majesty of its style, the truth of doctrine contained in it, and its agreement with the second epistle of Peter, and from the early reception of it in the churches. Hisipo says it was reckoned among the seven Catholic epistles, and was published in most churches, though he observes that many of the ancients made no mention of it, but certain it is that several of the ancient writers before him do make mention of it and cited as genuine, as Clemens, Clemen Alexandris, and T E R T U L L I A N, and O R I G E N. And as for the prophecy of Enoch cited in this epistle, it is not taken out of the Apocrypha book that bears that name, for the apostle makes no mention of any of his writing, but of a prophecy. And had he cited it out of that book, as it was truth, it can no more prejudice the authority of this epistle than the citations made of the Apostle Paul out of the heathen poets can affect his epistles, and whereas there is an account also given in this epistle of a dispute about the body of Moses, nowhere else to be met with, supposing it to be understood of his real body, of which, see Gil on Jude one nine, this can be no more an objection of the genuineness of this epistle, than the mention of Janus and Jambres, who withstood Moses by the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy 3, 8. It is an objection to an epistle of his, whose names are not to be met with in any other part of scriptures, but for what they were known by tradition, as might be the case here. The epistle is called Catholic, or general, because it is not written to any particular persons or church, but to the saints in general. And it may be to the same persons that Peter wrote his, see 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and who seems to be chiefly the believing Jews, see Jude 1.5. Though the Cyrenic version of Jude 1.1 1, 1 reads, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, to the nations, or Gentiles, called, etc. The design of the epistle is both to both is to exhort them to continue in the faith and contend for it, and to describe false teachers to point out their principles, practices, and dreadful end, and so they might shun and avoid them. Introduction to Jude 1. 
the writer of this epistle describes himself by his name, Jew, by his spiritual con- condition, quote, a servant of Christ, unquote, and by his natural relation, quote, a brother of James, unquote, and inscribes it to persons chosen of God, secured in Christ and called by grace. Jude one one, who he salutes and wishes a multiplication of mercy, peace, and love unto. Jude one two, and then points at the subject matter of the epistle, quote, the common salvation, unquote, and his view in writing it, which was to exhort them to contend earnestly for the gospel, which exhortation was necessary since some reprobate and wicked men, abuses of the grace of God, and blasphemers of the person of Christ, had got in among them. Jude one three. And in order to defer them from following their pernicious ways, he lays before them various instances of divine vengeance on sinners, as the Israelites whom God delivered out of Egypt, and yet destroyed them for their unbelief. The angels, who, not content with their first estate, forsook their habitation, and are reserved in chains of darkness, to the day of judgment, and the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the adjacent cities, who, for their uncleanliness, suffer the vengeance of eternal fire as an example to others. Jude 5, in like manner, the apostle observes, these false teachers who were filthy dreamers defiled themselves for such sins and also despised and spoke evil of civilian magistrates. Jude 1, 8, which sin of theirs is aggravated by Michael the archangel, not railing at the devil in a contention with him about the body of Moses, but generally reproving him by speaking evil of what they were ignorant of, and by their brutish sensuality, in corrupting themselves in things that they had not natural knowledge of. Jude one nine, and both their sin and punishment are exemplified in the cases of Canaan, Cain and Balaam and Korah, being guilty of hatred of the brethren of covetousness and of contradiction. Jude one eleven, and by various metaphors are set forth their intemperancy, hypocrisy, instability, unfruitfulness, pride, wrath, and lust, for whom the blackest darkness is reserved forever. Jude one twelve, the certainty of which is proved from an ancient prophecy of Enoch concerning the coming of Christ to judgment, when vengeance will be taken on those men for their ungodly deeds and hard speeches. Jude one fourteen who are further described by their murmurs and complaints, by their pride, respected persons, and covetousness, by their scoffs, and walking after their own lust, as they had been foretold by the apostles of Christ, by separating themselves from the saints, and by their sensuality, and not having the Spirit of God. Jude one seventeen, And the apostle having thus at large described these false teachers, by reason of whom the saints were in danger, directs them, to the use of means by which they might be secured from them, such as building themselves up in their most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping themselves in the love of God, and looking for the mercy of Christ unto eternal life. Jude one twenty, And he teaches them not only to be concerned for themselves, but for others also, who were in danger from these deceivers to deal with some in a tender and compassionate way, with others more roughly, expressing and hatred to a filthy commun- conversation. Jude one twenty two, And then the epistle is concluded with a doxology, or an inscription of glory, to the wise, only wise God, our Savior, who is able to keep his people from falling to such pernicious principles and practices, and to present them falseless before his glorious presence with exceeding joy. Jude one twenty four. Jude one one, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Jude 1.1 1, 1. Verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the author of this epistle, is the same who is elsewhere called Judas. Luke 6.16 6, Who is one of the twelve apostles of Christ, whose name was also Levinus, and whose surname was Thaddeus. Matthew 10.3 the name is the same with Judah. Genesis 29.35 Which comes from a word that signifies to praise or confess. And the rabbinical dialect is called A-D-W-Y, Judah, as here.
He styles himself the servant of Jesus Christ. See Gil on Romans 1 1. Romans 1 1. Though this is a title common to all believers, yet here and in some other places it is peculiar to an apostle or minister of the gospel, and therefore is used not merely in humility and in acknowledge obediency to Christ, but as a title of dignity and honor, and the apostle goes on to describe himself by his natural relation. And brother of James, not the son of Zebedee, but of Alphaeus, Matthew 10.2. And this he mentions partly to distinguish himself from others of that name as Judas Iscariot and Judas called Barsippus, and partly for the sake of honor and credit, James being a very great man, a man of great note and esteem, who seemed to be a pillar in the church, and was called the brother of our Lord, Galatians 2.9. An account of the persons to whom this epistle is ascribed next follows. To them that are sanctified by God the Father. Which is to be understood not of internal sanctification, which is usually ascribed to the Spirit of God, but to the act of eternal election, which is particular, peculiar to God the Father, in which sense Christ is said to be sanctified, by the Father, and men ordained and appointed to an office, and vessels are set apart, the owner's use. John 10.36, Jeremiah 1.5 The language is taken from the ceremonial law, by which persons and things are sanctified, or set apart for sacred use and service. See Exodus 13.2 And so the elect of God are by God the Father sanctified, and set apart in the act of election, which is expressed by this word, partly because of its separating nature, men being by it separated from the rest of the world, to the use and service of God, and for his glory, so that they are a distinct and peculiar people, and partly because such are chosen through sanctification of the Spirit, and unto holiness both in this world and that which is to come, so that the doctrine of election is no lascivious doctrine, for though holiness is not the cause of it, Yet it is a means fixed in it, and is certain by it, and an evident of it. The Alexandrian copy and some others in the Vulgate, Latin, and Syriac versions read, quote, To them that are loved by God the Father, unquote. Election is the fruit and effect of love. Those who are sanctified or set apart by the Father in election are loved by him. The Ethiopic version renders it quite likewise, Quote, to them that love God the Father, unquote, which flows from the Father's love to them, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Those who are sanctified or set apart by God the Father in election are in Christ, for they are chosen in him. They have a place in his heart, and they are put into his hands, and are in him, and united to him as members to, to in head, and were represented by him in the covenant of grace, and being in him they are preserved by him, and that before they are called, as well as after. Wherefore this character is put before that of being called, though the Seric version puts that in the first place. There is a secret preservation of them in Christ before calling, from condemnation and the second death. They were not preserved from falling in Adam, which the rest of mankind, nor the corruption of human nature, nor from actual sins and transgressions, yet, notwithstanding these, were so preserved that the law could not execute the sentence of condemnation on them, nor sin damn them, nor Satan, who led them captive, hail them to prison. And after calling, they are preserved, not from indwelling sin, nor from the temptations of Satan, nor from doubts and fears and unbelief, nor from slips and falls into sin, but from the tyrancy and dominion of sin, from being devoured by Satan, and from a total and final falling away. They are preserved in the love of God, and of Christ, in the covenant of grace, in the state of justification and adoption, in the paths of truth, faith, and holiness, and are preserved safe to the heavenly kingdom and glory. Their other character follows, and called, not merely externally by the ministry of the word, but internally by the spirit and grace of God, so that this is to be understood of a special 
and effectual call, whereby souls are called out of darkness into light, and from bondage to liberty, and from a dependency on themselves to the grace and righteousness of Christ, and from society with the men of the world to fellowship with him and to eternal glory, so as to have faith and hope concerning it. Jude, verse 2. Mercy unto you, and peace, and love, be multiplied. Jude, verse 2. Verse 2. Mercy unto you, in peace and love be multiplied. In this salutation, the Apostle wishes for a multiplication of mercy from God the Father, by whom these persons were sanctified. Mercy is a perfection in God, and shows itself in a special manner towards the elect in the covenant of grace, in provision of Christ as a Savior, in the mission of Him into this world, in redemption by Him in the forgiveness of sin and regeneration, and in their whole salvation and the multiplication of it intends in a large view and fresh application of it, which they sometimes stand in need of as under desertions, when they want the sense and manifestations of it to them, and under temptations and afflictions, when they need sympathy and compassion, and when they fall into sin, they stand in need of, a fr- of the fresh discoveries and application of pardoning mercy to them. Moreover, herein is wished for the multiplication of peace from Christ, in whom these chosen ones were preserved, and may design a fresh and enlarged view of peace being made for them by his blood, and an increase of conscience peace in their own hearts as the effect of it, and may include peace and an abundancy of it, among themselves, as well as all prosperity, both external, internal, and eternal. Likewise, in the salutation, quote, love, unquote, and a multiplication of it is wished for from the Spirit of God, by whom they are called, and may be understood of the love for with which God loved them, and which may be said to be multiplied when it is gradually shed abroad in their hearts, by the Spirit, and they are by degrees led into it more and more. And the acts of it are drawn out and set before them one after another. The fresh manifestations of it are made into them as an afflictive providence after the hidings of God's face and under temptations. And it may design the love with which they love God which may be increased and may be abound more and more. Jude, verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Jude, verse 3. Verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, the Apostle calls the persons he writes unto, quote, beloved, unquote, as they were of God and by him and other saints. And he signifies his diligency in writing to them, and the subject of his writing was of the common salvation, which designed either the gospel, sometimes called salvation, in opposition to the law, which is the ministration of condemnation, and because it is a declaration of salvation and a means of it, it may be said to be Quote, common, unquote, because preached to all Jews and Gentiles, or Jesus Christ the Savior himself, who is also sometimes called, quote, salvation, unquote, because he was called and appointed to it and undertook it, and is become the author of it and may be said to be a, quote, common, unquote, Savior, not of all men, but of all people, of his whole body, the church, and every member of it, and of all sorts of men, in all nations, or else that spiritual and eternal salvation wrought out by him, which is common, not to all men, for all are not saved with it, but to all the elect of God, and true believers in Christ. The love of God is common to them all alike. The choice of them to eternal salvation is the same. The covenants of grace, the blessings and promises of it, are equally shared by them, and they are bought with the same price 
of Christ's blood and are justified by the same righteousness and are regenerated, sanctified, and called by the same grace and shall possess the same glory. There is but one way of salvation and that is not confined to any nation, family, community, or sect among men. The Alexandrian copy in the two of Bezos and the Seric Virgin read, quote, our common salvation, unquote. And the two other of Bezos' copies and the Vulgate Latin version reads, quote, your common salvation, unquote. The sense is the same. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. By the, quote, faith, unquote, is meant the doctrine of faith, in which sense it is used whenever faith is said to be preached, obeyed, departed, or erred from, or denied, or made shipwrecked of, or when exhortations are made to stand fast and continue it in, in it, or to strive and contend for it, as here, and which is sometimes called the work of faith, the faith of the gospel, the mystery of faith, or most holy faith, the common faith, and as here, faith only, and designs the whole schemes of evangelical truths to be believed, such as the doctrine of the Trinity, the deity and sonship of Christ, the divinity and personality of the Spirit, which regards the state and condition of man by nature, by the doctrines of the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity, the corruption of nature and the impotency of men, to that which is good, what concerns the acts of grace in the Father, Son, and Spirit, towards and upon the sons of men, as the doctrines of everlasting love, eternal election, the covenant of grace, particular redemption, justification by the imputed, righteousness of Christ, pardon and reconciliation by his blood, regeneration and sanctification by the grace of the Spirit, final perseverancy, the resurrection of the dead, and the future glory of the saints with Christ. This is said to be, quote, delivered to the saints, end quote. It was delivered by God the Father to Christ as mediator, and by him to his apostles, who may more especially be meant by, quote, the saints, unquote, or holy men, who were chosen to be holy, and to whom Christ was made sanctification, and who were sanctified by the Spirit of God. And this faith, being a most holy faith, is fit for holy men, and only proper to be delivered to them, and preached by them. And by them it was delivered to the churches, both by word and writing, and this delivery of it supposes that it is not an invitation of men, that it is of God, and a gift of his, and given in trust, in order to be kept, held forth, and held fast. And it was but, quote, once, unquote, delivered, in opposition of the sundry times and diver manners, in which the mind of God was formally made known, and designs the uniformity, perfection, and continuance of the doctrine of faith, there is no alteration to be made of it, no addition to it, no new revelations are to be expected. It has been delivered all at once, and therefore should be, quote, earnestly contended for, unquote. For could it be lost, another could not be had. And the whole of it is to be contended for, not only the fundamentals, but the lesser matters of faith, and not things essential only, but also what are circumstantial to faith and re in religion. Every truth, ordinance, and duty, and particularly the purity of faith and its consistency. And this contention includes a care and solicitude for it, to have it, own it, and hold it fast, and adore it, and for the preservation of it, and for the spread of it, and that it might be transmitted to prosperity. And it denotes a conflict, a combat, or a fighting for it, a striving even to an agony. The persons to be contended with on account of it are such who deny or depreciate any of the persons in the Godhead and asserters of the purity and power of human nature and the denier of sovereign, efficient, and persevering grace. The persons who are to contend with them are all the saints in general, 
in whom it is delivered, which they may do by bearing an experimental testimony to it, by praying for the continuancy and success of it, by standing fast in one spirit in it, and by dying for it, and particularly the ministers of the gospel, which preaching it boldly, openly, fully, and faithfully, by disputing for it, and writing in the defense of it, and by laying down their lives, when called for. The manner in which this is to be done is, quote, earnestly, unquote, heartily, in good earnest, and without deceit, zealously, and constantly. Jude, verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, turning the grace of our God into a lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. These words contain a reason why the doctrine of faith should be contended for, because of false teachers who are described as being then upon the spot. The Apostle Peter and Paul had foretold that they would come, but Jude here speaks of them as in being. Wherefore, present rigor and vigilance were necessary to be used. Their names are not mentioned, nor their number, only that they were, quote, certain, unquote, or, quote, some men, unquote, which is done to stir up the saints to self-examination, whether they were in the faith, to diligence in finding out these men, to vigor in opposing them, and to care, to nip error and heresy in the bud. And they are said to have, quote, crept in unawares, unquote, either in private houses, as was the custom of those men, or into the churches, and become members of them, being the tares the enemy sows among the wheat, or into the ministry, assuming that office to themselves without being called and sent of God, and so into the public assemblies of the saints, spreading their poisonous doctrine among them, and also into their affections, until discovered. And so the... the Ethiopic version reads here, quote, Be an ungodly man, have entered into your hearts, unquote. And all this was at in unawares, privily, secretly, without any thought about them or suspicion of them, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation or judgment, meaning either judicial blindness of heart they were given up to in embracing and spreading errors and heresies, so that these are not casual things, but fall under the ordination and decree of God, which does not make God the author of them, nor excuse the men that hold them. And they were ordained and ordered for many valuable ends, on the part of God, to show his power and wisdom, and on the part of truth, that it might be tried and appear the brighter and to manifest his people and their graces, or else punishment is designed, even everlasting condemnation, to which some are preordained of God. For this act of preordination respects persons, and not mere actions and events, and is not a naked uh, prescience, but a real decree, and which is sure, certain, and irrevocable is God's act and springs from his sovereignty, is agreeably to his justice and holiness, nor is it contrary to his goodness, and is for his glory. The date of this act is, quote, of old, unquote, or as the Syriac version renders it, A-Y-R-W-V, capital N-M, quote, from the beginning, unquote, that is, from eternity. See 2 Thessalonians 2.13. For reprobation is the same date with election. If the one is from eternity, the other must be so too, since there cannot be one without the other. If some were chosen before the foundation of the world, others must be left or passed by as early. And if some were appointed unto salvation from the beginning, others must be foreordained to condemnation from the beginning also. And these words cannot be understood of any prophecy of old in which it was forewritten, or prophesied of these men, that they should be condemned for their ungodliness, not in Matthew 24, verse 1, 
in which no such persons are described as here, nor any mention made of their punishment or condemnation, nor in Second Peter 2.1, for then the apostle would never have said that they were, quote, of old, unquote, a long while ago before written or prophesied of, since according to the common calculation, that epistle of Peter's and this of Jude's were written in the same year, nor in the prophecy of Enoch, Jude one fourteen, for Enoch's prophecy was not written as we know of, and therefore these men could not be said to be before written in it. Besides, the prophecy is spoken of as something distinct from these persons being before written to condemnation. And after all, was a prophecy referred to, the sense would be the same. Since such a prophecy concerning them must be founded upon an antecedent ordination and appointment of God, the word here used does not intend there being forewritten in any book of the scriptures, but in the book of God's eternal purposes and degrees. And the justice of such a preordination appears by the following characters of them. Ungodly men. All men are by nature ungodly. Some are notoriously so, and false teachers are generally such. Here it signifies such who are destitute of the fear of God and of the internal devotion and powerful godliness and who did not worship God externally according to his institution and appointments and much less sincerely and in a spiritual manner and who even separated themselves from the true worshippers of God and gave themselves, themselves up to sensuality and therefore their condemnation was just. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness not the love and the favor of God, as in his own heart, or as shed abroad in the hearts of others, but that can never, for that can never, be turned to such a purpose. It always, working in a contrary way, know the principle of grace wrought in the soul, while being of a spiritual nature, lost is after the flesh, and cannot be turned into it, more likely the goodness of God in his providential dispensations, which is despised by some and abused by others, but rather the doctrine of grace, which through lasciviousness is not in its nature, nor has it any natural tendency to it. Yet wicked men turn or transfer it from its original nature, design, and use to a foreign one, and they may be said to turn it into lasciviousness, either by asserting it to be a lascivious doctrine, when it is not, or by treating it in a wanton and luterous manner, scoffing at it and lampooning it, or by making the doctrine of grace universal, extending it equally alike to all mankind, and therefore harden and encourage men in sin, and denying the only Lord God, God the Father, who is the only sovereign Lord, both in providence and grace, and the only God, not to the exclusion of the Son and Spirit, but in opposition to nominal and fictitious deities, or heathen gods, and he was denied by these men, if not in words, yet in works. The word, quote, God, unquote, is left out of the Alexandrian copy, and in the Vulgate Latin version. And our Lord Jesus Christ, as his deity or sonship or humility, or that he was the Messiah, or the alone Savior, or his sacrifice, satisfaction, or righteousness, with respect to either of which he may be said to be denied doctrinally, as he is also practically, when men do not walk worthy of their profession of him, and both might be true of these men, and therefore their condemnation was righteous. The copulative quote and unquote is omitted in the Syriac version, which seems to make this clause ex explanative of the former. Jude, verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. Jude 5, verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this. The Alexander copy and some others, and the Vulgate Latin version, version reads, quote, knew all things, unquote, 
but rather it is to be restrained by the following instant of God's vengeance on unbelievers, which, with others, is produced to vindicate the divine conduct in the condemnation of the above persons, and to show that that is certain and may be expected. Since God has always dealt thus with such persons, and this they knew by reading of the scriptures, at least they had known it once, though it may now be forgotten by them, and they had known it once for all. They had been perfectly acquainted with it, which is said, least the apostle should be thought to write to persons ignorant and rude in knowledge, and to show that he wrote nothing new and unheard of, and so should have the more weight and influence upon them. And he thought fit to remind them of it, though they had known it. It is one part of the work of the ministers in the word to put people in mind of what they have known, which is necessary, because of the inattractiveness of hearers, their forgetfulness and loss of knowledge, and the weakness of some capacities to take in and retain things. And if the judgment is not more informed hereby, yet the affections may be afresh arised, raised, and grace be drawn out into exercise, and the mind be established and confirmed. The incident follows how that the Lord, having saved saved the people out of the land of Egypt, that is, the people of Israel, who were the chosen people of God, a special people above all others, and had peculiar privileges, these the Lord brought out of the land of Egypt with a high hand and a mighty arm and saved them out of their bondage and delivered out of their oppressions and afflictions. The Alexander copy and some others in the Vulgate Latin and the Ethiopic version, that's E-T-H-I-O-P-I-C, instead of, quote, the Lord, unquote, read, quote, Jesus, unquote. And yet, though, they were a special people. And notwithstanding this wonderful deliverance and great salvation, he afterward destroyed them that believed not. Their carcasses fell in the wilderness by one judgment or another upon them, so that of all that came out of Egypt, but two entered into the land of Canaan. This shows the evil nature of unbelief and that God will not suffer sin to go unobserved in any. No outward privileges of profession will screen any from divine vengeance. God sometimes makes severe examples of mere nominal professors. Nor must false teachers, deniers of Christ, and perverters of his gospel expect to go free. Moreover, it may be observed that God may do great things for persons, and yet after all destroy them. Great riches and honors may be confirmed in some, great natural gifts on others, some may seem as if they had the grace of God and were brought out of spiritual Egypt and enjoy great mercies and favors and have many deliverances wrought for them and yet at last perish. Jude, verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Jude, verse 6. Verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate. Or, quote, principality, unquote, that holy, honorable, and happy condition in which they were created. For they were created in perfect holiness and righteousness, stood in the relation of sons to God, and were, for the luster of their nature, comparable to the morning stars. They were among the thorns, dominions, principalities, and powers were a superior rank of creatures to men, and who beheld the face and enjoyed the presence of God. But this estate they kept not, for being mutable creatures, one of them first sinning, the rest were drawn into it by him, and so were not what they were before, nor in the same estate or place, but left their own habitation. By attempting to rise higher, or by quitting their station and post of honor, being unwilling to be subject to God, and especially to the Son of God, who was to assume human nature, and in it be above them, which they could not bear, and by gathering together in a body, in another place, with Satan at the head of them, though this may be considered as a part of their punishment, and they may be said to do what they were forced to, 
for they were drove out of their native habitation heaven. They were turned out of it and cast down to hell. See Peter 2, 4. And this, their habitation, which they left or fell from, or they were cast out of, is by the Jews frequently called the place of their holiness or their holy place. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness. By these, quote, everlasting chains, unquote, may be meant the power and providence of God over them, which always abide upon them, or their sins, and the guilt of them upon their consciences, under which they are continually held, or the degrees and purposes of God concerning their final punishment and destruction, which are immutable and irreversible, and from which there is no flee, fleeing themselves, the phase under darkness may refer to the chains, as in Second Peter 2, 4, where they are called, quote, chains of darkness, unquote, either because the power, providence, and purposes of God are invisible. So the Sarah version reads, quote, in unknown chains, unquote, or because horror and black despair are the effects of sin and its guilt, with which their consciences are continually filled, or it may denote the place and state where they are, either in the darkness of the air or in the dark parts of the earth or in hell, where is utter darkness, even blackness of darkness, or that they are under the power of sin, which is darkness, and without the light of God's countenance or any spiritual knowledge or comfort. They are, quote, reserved, unquote, in these chains, and under this darkness or, quote, in prison, unquote, as the Arabic version renders it which denotes the custody of them and their continuance in it, in which they are kept by Jesus Christ, who can bind and lose Satan at his pleasure. And it shows that they are not uh, they are not as yet in full torment, but are like the malefactors that are kept in prison, until the assize comes. So these are laid in chains and kept in custody. Unto the judgment of the great day. This is the future, the last, quote, judgment, unquote, of men and devils, which is certain and will be universal and executed with the strictest justice. This is called, quote, a day, unquote, which is fixed by God, though unknown to men and angels, and because of the evidence and quick dispatch of things, the matters judged will be clear as the day, and finished at once, and a great one, for the judge will appear in great glory. Great things will be done, the dead will be raised, and all nations will be gathered together, and the process will be with great solemnity. The th- thrones will be set, the books open, the several sentences pronounced, and all punctually executed. The judgment of the great day is the same the Jews called ABR, and then A-N-Y-D, and then capital M-Y-W, no, M-W-Y. Quote, the day of the great judgment, unquote. This account shows the imprisoned states of the devil's that they are not their own lords and cannot do as they would. They are under restraints and in chains, and not to be feared, which must be a great mortification to their proud and malicious spirits. And since this is the case of fallen angels, their se- what severity may be expected from God against the opposers of the truth of the gospel. Jude, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude 7. Verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, Adama and Zeboim, for Zoar was spared. That's A-D-M-A-H and Z-E-B-O-I-I-M. This is a third instant of God's vengeance on sinners, and which, like that of the Israelites and of the angels, was after great favors had been enjoyed. These places were delightfully situated and very fruitful, as the garden of God. They were under a form of government, had kings over them, and had lately had a very great deliverancy from the kings that carried them captive, being rescued by Abraham. They had a righteous Lot among them, who was a reprover in the gate, and Abraham made intercession for them with God. But they, in like manner giving themselves over to fornication, not as the angels, who are not capable of sinning in such a manner, though the Jews 
made this to be a sin of theirs, and so interpret Genesis 6-2, but rather the Israelites among whom this sin prevailed. 1 Corinthians 10-8, though it seems best of all to refer it to the false teachers that turned the grace of God into lasciviousness and were very criminal this way. And then the sense is that in like manner as they, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah gave themselves over to the sin of fornication. Wherefore, these men might expect the same judgments that fell upon them, since their sin was alike, which sin is a work of the flesh, contrary to the law of God, is against the body and attended with many evils, exposes to judgment here and hereafter, and unfits for the communion of the saints and for the kingdom of heaven. And going after strange flesh, or, quote, other flesh, unquote, meaning not other women besides their own wives, but men, and designs that detestable and unnatural sin, which from these people is called sodomy to this day, and which is an exceeding great sin, contrary to the light of nature and law of God, dishonorable to human nature and scandalous to a nation and people, and commonly prevails where idolatry and infidelity do, as among the Papists and Mohammedans, and arose from idleness and fullness of bread in Sodom and was committed in the sight of God with great impudency. Their punishments follows, and set forth for an example, being destroyed by fire from heaven, and their cities turned into a sulfurous lake, which continues to this day as a monument of God's vengeance, and an example to all such who commit the same sins, and who may expect the same equitable punishment, and to all who live ungodly lives, though they may not be guilty of the same crimes, and to all that cite and reject the gospel revelation, with whom it will be more tolerable than for Sodom and Gomorrah, and to Antichrist, who bears the same name, and spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, and particularly to all false teachers, who, besides their strange doctrines, go after strange flesh, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, which may be understood of that fire with which those cities and inhabitants of it are concerned, which Pharaoh, the Jew says, burnt till his time, and must be burning when Jude wrote this epistle, the effects of which still continues, the land being now brimstone, salt, and burning, and is an emblem and representation of hellfire, between which there is a great likeness, as in the matter of them, both being fire and the efficient cause of them, both from the Lord and in the in instruments thereof, the angels, who as then will hereafter be employed in the deliverance of the righteous and in the burning of the wicked, and in the circumstance attending both suddenly at an unawares when not thought of and expected, and in the nature of them, being a destruction total, irreparable, and everlasting. And this agrees with the sentiments of the Jews who say that, Quote, the men of Sodom have no part or portion in the world to come, and shall not see the world to come. Unquote. Jude 8. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignitaries. Jude 8. Verse 8. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, which may be literally understood either of the Jewish doctors who pretend to be interpreters of dreams, or the false teachers in the apostles' times and their fil filthy dreams and their pollution of them, which sense the Ar Arabic and Ethiopic versions confirm the former rendering the words thus, quote, So these retiring in the time of sleep defile their own flesh, unquote, and the latter thus, quote, and likewise these, who in their own sleep pollute their own flesh, unquote, as also of their pretensions to devise assistance and intelligence by dreams, and likewise may be figuratively understood of them. For false doctrines are dreams, and the teachers of them dreamers, Jeremiah 23:25. As are all these doctrines of men that, are, that oppose the trinity of persons in the Godhead, that contradict the deity and sonship of Christ, 
that to appreciate any of his offices that lessen the glory of the person and the grace of the Spirit, that cry out the purity, power, and righteousness of human nature and are contrary to the free grace of God. These arise from the darkness of the understanding and the spirit of slumber upon them, are the fictions of their own brain and of their roving imagination, are illustrious and deceitful, and are in themselves vanities like dreams pass away. And the dreamers of these dreams may be said to, quote, defile the flesh, unquote, since they appear to follow and walk after the dictates of corrupt nature, and because of their unclean practices mentioned in the preceding verse, they defile the flesh, that is, the body. All sin is of a defiling nature, and all man, men are defiled with it. But these are, were notoriously so, and often so it is. These unclean practices follow upon erroneous principles. Despise dominion. Either the government of the world by God denying or speaking evil of his providence, the Ethiopic version renders it, quote, they deny their own God, unquote, either by either his being or rather his providence or the dominion and kingly power of Christ to which they cared not to be subject or rather civil majesty, which they despised as supposing it to be inconsistent with their Christian liberty and rejected it as being a restraint on their lusts choosing rather anarchy and confusion, that they might do as they please through magistra magistration as is God's ordinance, and magistrates are God's representatives, and speak evil of dignitaries, or, quote, glories, unquote. The Arabic version reads, quote, the God of glory, unquote. This is to be understood either of angels, those glorious creatures called thrones, dominions, etc., or ecclesiastical governors, who are set in the first and highest place in the church, and are the glory of the churches, or else civil magistrates, as before, who are the higher powers and sit in high places of honor and grandeur. False teachers are injurious to themselves, disturbers of churches and pernicious to civil government. Jude 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Jude 9, verse 9, Yet Michael the archangel, by whom is meant not a created angel, but an eternal one, the Lord Jesus Christ, had as appears from his name, Michael, which signifies, quote, who is as God, unquote, and who is as God, or like unto him, but the Son of God, who is equal with God, and from his character as the archangel or prince of angels, for Christ is the head of all principality and power, and from what is elsewhere said of Michael, as that he is the great prince, and on the side of the people of God, and have angels under him, and at his command, Daniel 10.21. So Philo the Jew caused the most ancient word, firstborn of God, the archangel, U-R-I-E-L, is called the archangel in this passage from the Apocrypha. Quote, and unto these things, Uriel the archangel gave them answer and said, even when the number of seeds is filled in you, for he hath weighed the world in the balance, unquote. Second Ezra 4.36 When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, which some understand literally of the fleshly and natural body of Moses, buried by the law himself, Lord himself, partly out of respect to him and partly as some think. At least the Israelites should be tempted to do an idolatrous worship of him, but rather it was to show that the law of Moses was to be abolished and buried by Christ, never to rise more. And they think that this dispute was either about the bearing of his body or the taking it of it up again. Satan, on the one hand, insisting upon the taking of it up in order to induce the Israelites to worship him, and Michael, on the other hand, opposing it to prevent this idolatry. But then the difficulty is where Jude should have this account, since the scriptures are silent about it. Some have thought that he took it out of the Apocrypha book called, quote, The Ascension of Moses, unquote, as uh, O-R-I-G-E-N, which is not likely. Others that he had it by tradition, by which means the Apostle Paul came by the name of the Egyptian musicians Janus and Jambres, and some passages are referred to in some of their writings as having some traces of this dispute, but in them the discourse is not concerning the body, but the soul of Moses, not concerning bearing or taking up of his body, 
when buried, but concerning the taking away of his soul, when he was alive, which none of the angels caring to undertake, at length Samuel, the chief of the, of the devils, that's S-A-M-A-E-L, did but without success. Wherefore God took it away with a kiss himself. Besides, the apostle produces this history as a thing well known, nor is it reasonable to suppose that such an altification should be between Michael and the devil on such an account, or that it was in order to draw Israel into idolatry on the one hand, and on the other to prevent it, since never was the custom of the Israelites to worship their progenitors or heroes, nor did they seem so well disposed to Moses in his lifetime, nor was there any necessity of taking up his body. Were they inclined to give him honor and worship, yea, the sight of his dead body would rather have prevented them than have encouraged it. But this is to be understood figuratively, and references to his, had to the history of Zechariah 3, 1. As appears from the latter part of this verse, some think the priesthood of Christ is intended, which was the end, the sum, and the substance of the law of Moses, and seeing that Joshua, the high priest, was a type of Christ, and the angel of God contended that with Satan about him. He might be said to dispute with him about the body of Moses. With this sense makes a type of a type, and Christ to contend about himself. Besides, this should rather be called the body of Christ than of Moses. Others think that the temple of the Jews is meant about the rebuilding of which the contention is thought to be, and which may be called the body of Moses, as the church is called the body of Christ. Though it should be observed that the temple is never so called, and that not the place where the church meets, but the church itself is called the body of Christ. But it is best of all to understand it of the law of Moses, which is sometimes called Moses himself. John 5.45 And so the body of Moses, or the body of his laws, the system of them, just as we call a system of laws, and of divinity, such as one's body of laws, and such in one's body of divinity. And this agrees with the language of the Jews, who say, of statutes, service, purification, etc., that they are H-R-W-T-H, Y-P-W-G, quote, the bodies of the law, unquote. And so of M-I-S-N-I-C, treaties, as those which concern the offerings of turtle doves and the purification of menstruous women, that they are YPWG, quote, the bodies, unquote, of the traditions, that is, the sum and substance of them. So the Decalogue is said to be the bodies, body of Shema, or, quote, here, O Israel, unquote, Deuteronomy 6, 4. So Clemens of Alexandria says, that there are some who consider the body of the scriptures, the words, and the names as if they were, quote, the body of Moses, unquote. Now the law of Moses was restored in the time of Joshua, the high priest, by Ezra and Nehemiah. Joshua breaks some of these laws and is charged by Satan as guilty, who contended and insisted upon it that he should suffer for it, so that this dispute or contention might be said to be about the body of Moses, that is, the body of Moses' law which Joshua had broken, in which dispute Michael, or the angel of the Lord, even the Lord Jesus Christ himself, does not bring against him a wailing accusation. That is, not that he was afraid of the devil, but though he could have given harder words, or severer language, in which the other deserved, yet he chose not to do it. He would not do it. In which sense the word, quote, durst, unquote, or, quote, dare, unquote, is used in Romans 5, 7. But said, the Lord rebuked thee. For thy malice and insolence, says, see, Zechariah 3, 2. And this mild and gentle way of using even the devil himself agrees with Christ's conduct towards him. When tempted by him in the wilderness, and when in his agony with him in the garden, and amidst all his reproaches and sufferings on the cross, and now the argument is from the greater to the lesser, that if Christ, the prince of angels, did not choose to give a wailing word to the devil, who is so much inferior to him, and when there was so much reason and occasion for it, 
then how great is the influence of these men that speak evil of civil and ecclesiastical rulers without any just cause at all. Jude 10 But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally, as brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Jude 10 Jude 10 But these speak evil of those things which they know not, which may more particularly refer to dignitaries. Jude one eight. Either angels, who are little known and not at all, but by revelation and yet were blasphemed or evil spoken of by these men, either by ascribing too much to them as the creation of the world, or by saying such things of them as were below and unworthy of them, as their congress with women, etc., or civil magistrates, these men were ignorant of the nature, use, and end of magistrate and civil governments, and so treated it with contempt or the ministers of the gospel, whose usefulness was not known, or at least not acknowledged by them, and so became the object of their scorn and reproach. Or it may refer more generally to the scriptures, which false teachers are ignorant of, and yet speak evil of, either by denying them to be the word of God, or by putting false glosses on them, and so to the several parts of the scriptures, as to the law, the nature, use, and end of which they are not acquainted with, and therefore blaspheme it, blaspheme it by not walking according to it, or by denying it to be of God and to be good, or by making the observations of it necessary to justification and salvation, and also to the gospel, the doctrines and ordinances of it which they speak evil of, despise and reject, not knowing the nature, value, and design of them. But what they know naturally as brute beasts. Man originally had a large share of natural knowledge, and there is in man still, notwithstanding the fall, by which his knowledge is impaired, a natural knowledge of God and of things natural, civil, and moral, and there is a sensitive knowledge in man which he has in common with the brutes, and which is here met. And such was the brutish sensuality of these men, that in those things they corrupt themselves, and act as brute beasts without shame and fear, yea, worse than brute beasts, as in the acts of unnatural lust mentioned in Jude seven, whereby they corrupt both their souls and bodies, and so shall be destroyed and perish in their corruption. Jude 11 Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam, for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. Jude 11. Verse 11. Woe unto them. This may be considered as a commiseration of their case, or as a denunciation of deserved punishment, or as a prediction of what would befall them. The Arabic version prefaces these words with an address to the saints, quote, O oh my beloved, unquote, that what was about to be said might be attended to as a caution and instruction to them. For they have gone in the way of Cain, which was a way of envy, for Cain envied the acceptance of his brother's gift, and that notice which the Lord took of him, so that these men envied the gifts bestowed on Christ's faithful ministers and the success that attended their labors and the honor that was put upon them by Christ and that was given them by the churches which shows that they were destitute of grace and particularly of the grace of charity or love which envies not and that they were in an unregenerate estate and upon the brink of ruin and destruction. Moreover, the way of Cain was a way of hatred and murder of his brother which his envy led him to. So these men hated the brethren, persecuted them unto death, as well as were guilty of the murder of the souls of men by their false doctrine, to which may be added as another of Cain's way, in consequence of the former absence from the presence of God, or the place of his worship. So these men separated themselves and went out from the churches, forsook the assembling together with them, and so might expect Cain's punishment to be driven from the face of God, Yea, to be bid to go as cursed into everlasting burnings.
and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. Balaam's heir, which he himself was guilty of, was covetousness, or an immoderate love of money, 2 Peter 2.15, which, as it is the root of all evil, is the ban of religion, and the source of heresy, and what the false teachers were greatly addicted to, and where it prevails, it is insatiable and not to be checked and stopped as in these men, and is a damnable sin, and excludes from the kingdom of heaven, as well as is dishonorable to religion, hence such particular notice is taken of it, lest it be found in the, a minister of the word. This character exactly agrees with the followers of Simon Magus, M-A-G-U-S. The error which Balaam led others into was both idolatry and adultery. Revelations 2.14 Which these false teachers were both guilty of themselves and taught others and indulged them therein. And which both teachers and people ran greedily after. Balaam is one of the four private persons who, according to the Jews, shall have no part or portion in the world to come. And perished in the gainsaying of Cori. The same with Korah, number 16.1. The Septuagin there calls him Cori, C-O-R-E, and so does Philo the Jew. As the Apostle does here, and by Josephus, he is called Cori's, C-O-R-E-S. Now the gain scene or contradiction of these men was like Korah's, K-O-R-A-H apostrophe S, as his was against Moses, the ruler of the people, so theirs against majesty. Magistrates, Jude 1, 8, which was gainsaying God's own ordinance and a contradiction of that which is for the good of men, the ground of which contradiction was love of liberty and their own lusts. And generally speaking, men perish in their fractions and rebellions against good and lawful magistrates. Also, as Korah gains, gainsaid Aaron, the priest of the Lord, so these men contradicted and opposed the ministers of Christ, whom they would have thrust out in order to put in themselves, and whose persons they re reviled and contradicted their doctrines, which to do is of dangerous consequence, and they might be said to perish in his gain, saying, as a type and example of their destruction, which would be swift and sudden, as he was, and to denote the certainty of it. So the Jews say of Korah and his company that they shall never arise or ascend up and stand in judgment, and that they shall have no part or portion in the world to come. Jude 12. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Jude 12. Verse 12. These are spots in your feast of charity, or, quote, love, unquote. The Jews speak, quote, of a feast of faith, unquote. These here seem to be the uh, A-G-A-P-A-E, or love feast of the primitive Christians, the designs of which was to maintain and promote brotherly love from whence they took their name, and to refresh the poor saints that they might have a full and comfortable meal now and then, their manner of keeping them was this. They began and ended them with prayer and singing, and they observed them with great temperancy and frugality, and they were attended with much joy and gladness and simplicity of heart, but were quickly abused by Judaizing Christians, as observing them in imitation of the Passover, and by intemperancy and eating and drinking and by excluding the poor, for whose benefit they were chiefly designed and by setting up separate meetings for them, and by admitting unfit persons unto them, such as here are said to be spots in them, blemishes, which brought great reproach and scandal upon them, being persons of infamous characters and conversations. The allusion is either to spots in garments, or in faces, or in sacrifices, or to a sort of earth that defiles, or else to rocks and hollow stones on shores, lakes and rivers which collect filth and slime, all of which serve to expose and point out the person's design. The Alexandrian copy and some others read, quote, these are in their own deceiving spots, unquote. 
A-P-A-T-A-I-B instead of A-G-A-P-A-I-B, as in 2 Peter 2.13. When they feast with you, which shows that they are among them, continued members with them and partook with them in their solemn feasts and were admitted to communion and carries in it a kind of reproof to the saints that they suffered such persons among them and allowed them such privilege, intimacy, and familiarity with them. Feeding themselves without fear. These were like the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves and not the flock and were very impetuous and in impious, open and barefaced in their iniquities, neither fearing God nor regarding man. Clouds, they are without water. They are compared to clouds for their number. Being many false prophets and antichrists, they were come out into the world, and for their sudden rise, having at once and at an unawares crept into the churches, and for the general darkness they spread over the churches, making it by their doctrines and practices to be a dark and cloudy day, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, a day of trouble, rebuke, and blasphemy, and for the storms, fractions, rents, and divisions they made, as also for the, the situation and height, soaring aloof, and being vainly puffed up in their fleshly minds, as well as for their sudden destruction disappearing at once, and to clouds, quote, without water, unquote, become destitute of the true grace of God and of true evangelical doctrine, which like rain is from above from heaven, and which, like that, refreshes, softens, and fruitifies. Now these false teachers looked like clouds that promised rain, boasted of gospel light and knowledge, but were destitute of it. Wherefore, their ministry was uncomfortable and unprofitable. Carried about of winds, either of false doctrines, or of their own lust and passion, or of Satan's temper- temptations. Trees whose fruits withereth, or, quote, trees in autumn, unquote, either like to them which put forth at that season of the year and so come to nothing, or like to trees which are bare of leaves as well as fruit. It being the time when the leaves fall from the trees, and so may be expressive of these persons casting off the leaves of an outward profession, of their going out from the churches, separating from them, and forsaking the assembly, assembling together with them, when what fruit of holiness and good works they seem to have came to nothing, and so were without fruit, either of gospel doctrine or of gospel holiness and righteousness. Nor did they make any true converts, but what they made were like the Pharisees, as bad or worse than themselves. And from their unfruitfulness in all respects, it appeared that they were not in Christ the true vine, and were not sent forth by him, nor with his gospel, and that they were destitute of the Spirit of God. Twice dead, that is, entirely twice dead, that is, entirely, thoroughly, and really dead in trespasses and sins, notwithstanding their pretensions to religion and godliness, or the sense may be that they were not only liable to a corporal death common to them with all mankind, but also an eternal one, or to the death both of soul and body in hell. Homer calls those, quote, twice dead, unquote, that go to hell alive, or rather the sense is this, that they were dead in sin by nature, as all men are, and again having made a profession of religion, were now become dead to that profession, and so were twice dead. Once, as they were born, and the second time, as they had apostatized. Plucked up by the roots, either by separating themselves from the churches where they had been eternally planted, or by the act of the church in cutting them off and casting them out, or by the judgment of God upon them. Jude 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Jude 13. Verse 13, raging waves of the sea, false teachers are so called for their swelling pride and vanity which, as it is, what prevails in human nature, is a governing vice in such persons. For knowledge without grace puffs up, and this shows that they had not received the doctrine 
of grace and truth, for that humbles, as also for their arrogancy, boasting, obstination, and for their noisiness, their restlessness, uneasy and turbulent spirits, for their furious and wrathful disposition, as well as their levity and inconsistency, and for their turpitude and filthiness, foaming out their own shame. Wrathful words, frothy and obscene language and filthy doctrines, and which expresses the issue of their noisy and boistering ministry, which ends in uncleanness, shame, emptiness, and ruin. Wandering stars. They are called, quote, stars, unquote, because they have the appearance of such and blaze for a while in seeming light, zeal, and warmth, and in fame and reputation and wanderings, ones, not comparable to the planets which go their regular course, but to fierce exaltations, gliding, and running stars, because they wander about from house to house, as well as from one nation to another, and being never settled in their principles, nor at a point in religion, and wander also after their own carnal lusts, and cause others to wander likewise, and at last become falling stars, not from real grace and sanctified knowledge, which they never had, but from truth to error, and from a seemingly holy life and conversation to a vicious one, and from a profession of religion to open profaneness, and whose fall is irrecoverable as that of stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever, or the blackest darkness, even utter darkness, which phrase not only expresses the dreadful nature of their punishment, their most miserable and uncomfortable condition, but also the certainty of it. It is, quote, reserved, unquote, for them among the treasures of divine wrath and vengeance by the righteous appointment of God, according to the just demerit of their sins, and likewise the duration of it. It will be forever. There will never be any light or comfort but a continual everlasting black despair, a worm that dieth not, a fire that will not be quenched, the smoke and blackness of which will ascend forever and ever. Hell is meant by it, which the Jews represent as a place of darkness. The Egyptian darkness, they say, came from the darkness of hell, and in hell the wicked will be covered with darkness, the darkness which was upon the face of the deep, at the creation they interpret of hell. Jude 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Jude 14. Verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. This was Enoch, the son of Jared. His name signifies one, quote, instructed, unquote, or, quote, trained up, unquote, as he doubtless was by his father in the true religion in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and was one that had much communion with God. He walked with him and was translated by him, body and soul, to heaven, and did not see death. Genesis 5.18 He is said to be, quote, the seventh from Adam, unquote. Not the seventh man from him that was born into the world, for there were no doubt thousands born before him, but he was, as the Jews expressed it, Quote, the seventh generation, unquote, from him. And they have an observation that all sevens are always beloved by God. The seventh in lands, the seventh in generation. Adam, Seth, Enos, uh, Cana, that's C-A-I-N-A-N, Mahathalee, M-A-H-A-L-A-L-E-E-L, Jared, Enoch, as it is written, Genesis 5.24, and this is said partly to distinguish him from others of the same name, and particularly from Enoch, the son of Cain, the third, from Adam in his line, as this was the seventh from Adam in the line of Seth, and partly to observe the antiquity of the following prophecy of his, for it is said he prophesied of these, of these false teachers and such as they what would be their sad state of condition at the second coming of Christ to judgment. That he had a spirit of prophecy is evident from the name he gave to his son. M-T-H, no, M-E-T-H-U-S-E-L-A-H, which signifies, quote, when he dies is the omission, 
unquote, or descending out of the waters of the flood, which came to pass the very year he died. The Arabic rites call him E-D-R-I-S, the prophet, and the Jews said that he was in a higher degree than Moses or Elias. They also call him Metatron, the great scribe, a name which they sometimes gave to the angel that went before the children of Israel in the wilderness, and which seems to belong to the Messiah, that Enoch wrote a prophecy and left it behind him in writing, does not appear from hence or elsewhere. The Jews, in some of their writings, do cite and make mention of the book of Enoch, and there is a fragment now that bears his name, but is a spurious piece, and has nothing like this prophecy in it. Wherefore, Jew took this not from a book called the, quote, Apocryphus of Enoch, unquote, but from tradition, this prophecy being handed down from age to age, and was in full credit with the Jews, and therefore the apostle very appropriately produces it, or rather he had it by divine inspiration, and is as follows, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. By the, quote, Lord, unquote, is meant the Lord Jesus Christ, who is ordained the judge of quick and dead, and for which he is richly qualified, being omniscient and omnipotent and faithful and righteous, and who will certainly come again to judge the world in righteousness, for not of his first coming, which was not to judge and condemn, but to seek and save, but of his second coming, at the last day, is this to be understood. And this is expressed in the present tense, quote, cometh, unquote, in the manner of the prophets who speak of the things future, as if they already were, as Isaiah does of the incarnation, sufferings, and death of Christ, and to awaken the attention of persons to it, as if it was near at hand, as also to signify the certainty of it, and when he comes, he will be attended, quote, with ten thousand of the saints, unquote. Meaning either with the souls of glorified saints, even all of them, First Thessalonians 3.13, which will come with Christ and meet the living ones and be reunited to their own bodies, which will then be raised, or else the holy angels, as in Deuteronomy 33.2. And so some copies in the Arabic version read, which will be both for the showing forth of his glory and majesty, and for service in gathering his elect together, as well as for terror to the wicked. And a, quote, behold, unquote, is befixed to all this, to denote the certainty of Christ's coming, and the importance and wonderfulness of it. The ends of his coming follow. Jude 15. To execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude 15. Verse 15. To execute judgment upon all, quick and dead, small and great, high and low, rich and poor, good and bad, righteous and wicked, sheep and goats, to pass the definite sentence of each that of absolution, life, and happiness on his own people, and that of condemnation, death, and misery on the wicked, which will be done in the most strict and righteous manner, and to convince all that are ungodly among them. Those who are without God, the fear of him, love to him, or faith in him, who have lived without the worship of him, or in a false worship, and particularly false teachers, are here meant, the same as in Jude 1.4 who will then be convicted in their own consciences by the clear evidence, by the clear evidence and full light in which things will be set, of all their ungodly deeds, both against law and gospel, which they have ungodly committed, which they lived in the commission of and continually practiced in a vile manner, publicly, and in defiance of heaven, and with sheared consciences, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, either, quote, against, unquote, God, as the Vulgate Latin version reads, against his being, his perfections, his providence, his purposes, his word, and worship, or rather against Jesus Christ the Lord, who will come to judge them against his person and offices, his blood, righteousness and sacrifice, his ministers and people, his truths and ordinances. Jude 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words 
having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Jude 16. Verse 16. These are murmurers, that is, at, at others, secretly, inwardly, in a muttering way, granting out their murmurers like swine, to which, for their filthiness and apostasy, false teachers may be fully compared. And their murmurs might be both against God and men. Against God, against the being of God, denying or at least wishing there was no God, and, and uneasy because there is one. Against the perfections of God, particularly his sovereignty over all, his special goodness to some, his wisdom, justice, truth, and faithfulness. Against this, his purposes and decrees, both with respect to things temporal, spiritual, and eternal against the providence of God in his government of the world and the unequal distribution of things in it, and especially against the doctrines of free grace and the ordinances of the gospel. And not only are they murmurs against God and all divine things and persons, but also against men, particularly against civil magistrates, who restrain them and are a terror to them, and against the ministers of the gospel, whose gifts and usefulness they envy, and indeed against all men their neighbors, and what they enjoy, and at everything that goes besides themselves, it follows. Complainers. Some join the above character, and this together, and read as the Vulgate Latin version, quote, complaining murmurers, unquote. Others, as the Syriac version, place not only a comma, but a culp- copulative between them, and as the former may design secret and inward murmuring, This may intend outward complaining in words, not of their own sins and corruptions, nor of the sins of others with any concern for the honor of religion or for the decay of powerful godliness in themselves or others, or of the failure of the gospel and the decrease of the interests of Christ, but either of God, that he has not made them equal to others in the good things of life, as the Arabic virgin renders it, quote, complaining of their own lots, unquote, and that he lays so much affliction upon them more than on others or of men, that their salaries are not sufficient and that they are not enough respected according to their merit. And indeed, as the Syriac version reads, quote, they complain of everything, unquote, and are never satisfied and easy, walking after their own lusts, which are carnal and worldly. See Gil on Second Peter 3.3. 3. And their mouths speak a grace swelling words, both against God and men, and this may point at their boast of knowledge, their great obstination of learning, their vain and empty doctrines, their high flights, their ridicule, uh, um, style, and blah blah language, heavy men's persons and admiration because of advantage, crying up men of their own stamp for the advantage of the party, and giving flattering titles to men of wealth and riches for the sake of their money. So the Ethiopic version, quote, they studied to please persons to make gain of them, unquote. They were respecters of persons, so the phrase is used by the Septuagint in Deuteronomy 10, 17, and in Job 22, 8, and in Proverbs 18, 5, and in Isaiah 9, 15. Jude 17. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jude 17. Verse 17. But beloved, or, quote, my beloved, unquote, as a Syriac and Arabic versions read, or, quote, our brother, unquote, as the Ethiopic version, the apostle addresses the saints in this manner to distinguish them from the false teachers and to show that he had a different opinion of them from them and that he, that B would have them Beware of them, and not be surprised at them, since it is no other than what was foretold, and also to engage their attention in regard to the following exhortation. Remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. These words mean not the doctrines of the apostles in general, but particularly the prophecies delivered out by them, as by the apostles Paul and Peter. By the apostle Paul and Peter concerning the false teachers that should arise, and these being spoken of before and by apostles, even by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, were worthy of regard and deserve to be remembered 
a remembrancy of which is a preservative from error, and a relief in the worst of times, whether a persecution or heresy. This does not suppose that Jude was not an apostle, only that there were other apostles besides him, and that these, some of them at least, had prophesied of these men, and that he had lived to see their predictions verified. Nor does he exclude himself from being one of them. Yea, the Ethiopic version reads, quote, which we, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, have formally declared unto you, unquote. See 2 Peter 3, 2. Jude 18. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Jude 18. Verse 18. How that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time. See Gil on 2 Peter 3, 3. Jude 19. These be they who separate themselves. Sensual, having not the Spirit. Jude 19. Verse 19. These be they who separate themselves. Not from sinners openly profane. Such a separation is commemorable, being according to the will and word of God, to the mind and practice of Christ, and which tends to the good of men and to the glory of God, but from the saints and people of God. It is possible that a child of God may for a time leave the fellowship of the saints, but an entire and total forsaking of them, and of assembling with them, looks with an ill aspect, nor did they separate themselves from superstition, and will worship, and every false way of worship, which would have been right, but from the pure worship, ordinances, and discipline of God's house, by a perversion of them, and as being above them or unwilling to be under any notice in government, not from errors and heresies and persons that held them, with these they herded, but from the pure doctrine of the gospel and ministers of the word and made divisions and separations among the churches for worldly ends and through pride and affection of vain glory, as they were more knowing, more holy, and more spiritual than other men when they were. Sensual, such as gave themselves up to sensual lusts and pleasures, and at best were but natural men, who had only natural and rational abilities, but without spiritual and experimental knowledge. Hence it follows, having not the Spirit, though they might have some external gifts of the Spirit, or he himself dwelling in them as a spirit of conviction and illumination, as a spirit of regeneration and sanctification, as a spirit of faith and comfort, as a spirit of adoption, and as the earnest and pledge of the heavenly glory. They were not under his influence, nor did they feel the operation of his grace, nor had they communion with him. Hence they appeared to be none of Christ, nor could they claim interest in him, and were without life, and so could not persevere. Jude 20 But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Jude 20 Verse 20, But ye, beloved, see Gil on Jude one seventeen, Building up yourselves in your most holy faith. Some copies, and the C-O-M-P-L-U-T-E-N-S-I-A-N edition reads, quote, Our most holy faith, unquote, meaning the doctrine of faith in all its branches, which is holy, our most holy doctrine, which displays the holiness of God and is a means of beginning and increasing internal uh, holiness in the saints and of encouraging and exciting those, them to external holiness of life and conversation. This phrase, quote, holy faith, is in use with the Jews, and it becomes the saints to build up one another upon this, the doctrine of faith. It is a foundation to build upon, particularly what regards the person, offices, and grace of Christ, and is itself of an edifying nature, and they should not content themselves with their present knowledge of it, but seek for an improvement in it, and though they uh, were passive when first built on Christ and his doctrines, and though ministers were greatly instruments in building of them up more and more, yet they are capable of building up themselves and one another by attending on the ministry of the word and by private um, conversation with each other, and particularly by praying in the Holy Ghost, which is a special means of increase and establishment in the doctrine of faith. The Holy Ghost is the author and editor and ender of prayer, and an assistant, a sister in it. 
Without him, saints cannot call God their Father, nor pray with faith or fervency, or with freedom and liberty. Jude 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jude 21. Verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, by which may be meant either the grace and favor of God, the love with which God loves his people, and then the exhortation to the saints to keep themselves in it is, to set it always before them, to keep it constantly in view, to exercise faith on it, firmly believing their interest in it, as also to meditate on it, give themselves up wholly to the contemplation of it, and employ their thoughts constantly about it, which is the foundation of all grace here and glory hereafter, or to preserve themselves by it. For so the words may be rendered, quote, preserve yourselves by the love of God, unquote, against Satan's temptations, the snares of the world, and the lust of the flesh. Whenever Satan solicits to sin, and any snare is laid to draw into it, and the flesh attempts to be predominant, saints should betake themselves to the love of God as to a stronghold and and preservative against sin and reason, as um, Joseph did, um, Genesis 39.9, for the love of God and the continuance in it. Do not depend on anything that can be done by men, nor is there any danger um, of real believers falling from it or losing it, since it is unchangeable and is from everlasting to everlasting. Or else by the love of God, we are to understand that love with which his people love him and of which he is the object. Luke 11.42 And then the meaning of the exhortation is that through this grace of love cannot be lost, yet inasmuch as the fever of it may be abated, and the people of God grow cold and indifferent to their expressions of it, it becomes them to make use of all proper means to maintain and increase it in themselves and others, such as are mentioned in the content as conversing together in an edifying way about the doctrines of the gospel and praying either separately or together under the influence of the Holy Spirit and look forward for the grace and mercy of Christ unto everlasting life, all of which, with many other things, by the blessing of God, may serve to maintain and revive the grace of love and blow it up into a flame. Though, perhaps, this phrase may chiefly design that love, peace, and concord, which ought to subsist among saints as brethren, and which they should be careful to preserve and may be called the love of God, just as the same thing is styled the peace of God, Colossians 3.15, because it is what God requires, what he calls unto, which is of him and is taught by him, and regeneration, and what his love engages to, and without which there is no true love to him. And he takes love shown to his people, as if shown to himself, and this sense is favored by the context, both of the words in the preceding verse and in the following ones. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The mercy of Christ may be considered either as past, which was shown in eternity, in his covenant transaction with his Father, in engaging in the cause of his people, in espousing them to himself, and in the care of their persons, grace, and glory, and in time, in assuming their nature in his tender concern for the bodies and souls of men, in bearing the sins and sorrows of his people, in the redemption of them, and in their regeneration and calling. And there is the present mercy of Christ in interceding for his people, in sympathizing with them under all their afflictions, in securing them under all their temptations and suiting himself as the great shepherd to all the circumstances of his flock and there is the future mercy of Christ which will be shown at death in the grave and at the resurrection at the day of judgment and the merciful sentence he will pronounce on his people and this seems to be designed here the consequences of which or what is annexed to it and in which it issues is eternal life which is not owing to the works of men but to the grace of God and mercy of Christ Eternal life is in him and is given through him, and to his mercy should men look for it. Christ himself is to be looked for, who will certainly come a second time, and eternal life is to be looked for by him, and this is only to be expected through his grace and mercy, and this is to be looked for by faith, in the love of it, with delight and pleasure and cheerfulness, with eagerness and yet with patience. Jude 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Jude 22. Verse 22, and of some have compassion, that is, of such who have gone astray, 
being drawn aside, who are simple and ignorant and out of the way, who sin through infirmity and the force of temptation, and who are attractable and open to conviction, and whose mistakes are in lesser matters of religion, as also such who are convicted and wounded in their consciences for their sins and mistakes. And to these compassion is to be shown by praying for them and for them with ardency and affection, instructing them in meekness, giving friendly and brotherly reproofs to them, expressing on all occasions a tender concern for their good, doing them all the good that can be done, both for their souls and bodies and good reason. There is why compassion should be shown them, because God is a God of compassion. Christ is a merciful high priest. A contrary spirit is grieving to the Holy Ghost. Saints should consider what they themselves were and what they now are, and that compassion has been shown to them, and they may want it again. The Alexandrian copy and some others, and the Vulgate, Latin, and Ethiopic version read, quote, reprove, unquote, making a difference between one and another, using some more tenderly, others more severely, as the nature and circumstances of their case appear to be. The Syriac version renders the whole, quote, when they repent, they compassion, they have compassion on them, unquote. Jude 23. And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Jude 23. Verse 23. And others say with fear, meaning false teachers who lead others into errors, and such as give themselves over unto sin, whether teachers or hearers, or who are obstinate and irreclaimable, even such as these, means should be used to save, if possible, by sharp admonitions and severe language, by denouncing the awful judgments of God, which threaten them, by inflicting on them church censors in a terrible manner, by declaring the terrors of the Lord and of hell and of everlasting damnation, pulling them out of the fire, of their soul-destroying doctrines and of their filthy and unnatural lusts, and as it were out of the fire of hell, of which they are in great danger, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh, by which may be meant the conversation of those men, even their filthy conversation, which is to be hated, though their persons are not, by all ways and means should be used to save them, and this is one way by showing a dislike unto, and a resentment at their wicked way of living, excluding them from church communion for it, and shunning all conversation with them. The allusion is not to garments defiled by pervicious persons or menstruous women, as some think, but to garments spotted by natural pollution or through unnatural lust, which these persons are addicted to. It was reckoned very dishonorable for religious persons in the time of divine service or on a Sabbath day to have on a garment spotted with anything. If a priest's garments were spotted and he performed service in them, that service was not right. And if a disciple of a wise man had any grease on his garments on a Sabbath day, he was guilty of death. Two twenty-four. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Jude 24. Verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. The people of God are liable to fall into temptation, into sin, into errors and mistakes from an exercise of grace or from a degree of steadfastness in gospel truths and even into a final and total apostasy, were it not for divine power, and they are not able to keep themselves. Adam, in his state of innocency, could not keep himself from falling, nor could the angels, many of whom fell, and the rest are preserved by the grace of God, whereby much less can imperfect sinful men keep themselves. They want both skill and power to do it, nor can any short of Christ keep them, and it is his work and office to preserve them. They were given to him with this view, and he undertook to do it. And the sensible sinners commit themselves to him as being appointed for that purpose, and this is a work Christ has been and is employed in, and he is every way qualified for it. He is, quote, able, unquote, to do it, for he is the mighty God, the creator and upholder of all things, and as mediator, he has all power in heaven and in earth. Instances of persons kept by him prove it, and there is such evidence of it that believers may be and are persuaded of it, and he is as willing as he is able. It is his Father's will. He should keep them, and in that he delights. And as he has undertook to keep them, he is accountable for them. 
Besides, he has an interest in them and the greatest love and affection for them, to which may be added that the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit in man's salvation depends on the keeping of them and what he keeps them from is from falling by temptation, not from being tempted by Satan, but from sinking under his temptations and from being devoured by him and from falling by sin, not from the being or commission of sin, but from the dominion of it and from the falling into it so as to perish by it and from falling into damnable heresies and from the true grace of God and into final impenitency, unbelief and total apostasy. Instead of, quote, you, unquote, the Alexandrian copy reads, quote, us, unquote, and some copies read, quote, them, unquote. And to present you, falseless, before the presence of his glory, with exceeding joy, to himself in this present state of things, as washed in his blood and justified by his righteousness, and hereafter, in the millennium stage and in the ultimate glory, and also to his father, and this he died to do, and in some sense did it at his death, even in the body of the flesh, though through death, and now as the representative of his people in heaven, and will at the last day, when he will deliver them up complete and perfect, all which is in consequence of his surety ship engagements, and this presentation is made, quote, before the presence of his glory, end quote, either before the glorious presence of Christ or Christ himself, who is glorious and will appear in glory, in his own and in his Father's, and in his holy angels, or else before the glorious presence of God the Father, and who is glory itself. And the condition in which the saints are and will be presented is falseless, quote-unquote. That they have sinned in Adam, and were so wretchedly guilty and filthy in their nature state, natural state, so prone to backsliding, and guilty of so many after conversion, and through a body of sin and death is carried by them to the grave, yet they will at last be presented by Christ, in perfect holiness, in complete righteousness, and in the shining robes of immortality and glory. The manner in which they will be presented is, quote, with exceeding joy, unquote, in themselves, for what they shall be delivered from, from sin and sorrow, and every enemy, and for the glory and happiness they shall then enjoy, and also in the ministers of the gospel, who will then bring their sheaves with joy, and then will their converts be their joy and crown of rejoicing, and likewise this presentation will be with the joy of angels, for if they rejoice at the conversion of men, much more at their glorification, and even with the joy of Father, Son, and Spirit. J25, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Jude 25, verse 25, to the only wise God our Savior, by whom is meant not the eternity of persons in general, nor the Father in particular, but the Lord Jesus Christ, who is truly God, though not to the exclusion of the Father and Spirit, and is the wisdom of God and the author of all wisdom, natural and spiritual, and is the only Savior of his people unto him may be, as is ascribed the glory of his deity and divine sonship and of his uh, meteor mediator works and of salvation and majesty which belongs to him as God and which he has in his human nature being crowned with glory and honor and enthroned and set down at the right hand of God dominion both natural and the kingdom of nature and providence belonging to him and a mediator which is above all reaches wide and far and will last forever and power in making and upholding all things in redeeming his people, in protecting and defending them, and in destroying his and their enemies, in raising the dead and judging the world. Through though the Alexandrian copy and others say some others, and the Vulgate Latin version read, quote, to the only God our Savior by Jesus Christ our Lord, unquote, and leave out the word quote, wise, unquote. And so there are to be understood of God the Father by the Ethiopic version reads, quote, this is the only God our Savior Jesus Christ to whom, unquote, etc. And all this is to be attributed to him, both now and ever, in the present life and to all eternity. Amen. Which is an assent unto it, that so it should be, and a wish that so it may be, an expression of faith and strong asseveration that so it shall be.